Classic Baptist theologian Herschel Hobbes said this, a family is not simply a group of people dwelling under one roof. By that definition, any hotel or prison could qualify. A family is not a group of people bearing the same name. Persons with the same name may live all over the nation and be total strangers. A family can have a variety of compositions, parents and children, a married couple without children, a single parent and children, among others. Family is not simply people, but a spirit of oneness. It is a spirit produced through loving and longing, laughter and tears, shared joy and sorrow, mutual struggle and respect, faith and joy and sorrow, mutual struggle and respect, faith and faithfulness, and a common pursuit of worthy goals. I'm a member of a family. Matter of fact, there are a handful of people that I've run into that have the last name Smith that I don't think I'm related to. Yep. I just find it kind of humorous when someone says, I'm sorry, how did you spell that last name? <laughs> That's an old trick of like getting someone's last name. Like, okay, I'll spell it real slowly. S-M-I-T-H. It gets even better when you go, and first name? P-A-U-L. I uh, didn't get much easier than that. But, but you know, it's, I'm part of a family. If you are a Christian, you are a part of our family. Yes. You're part of the family of God. In 1 John, he's going to address this idea of us as believers being a part of one family. So if you turn to 1 John, we'll be looking at it for the uh, next couple of months. If you're not sure where 1 John is, it's right in front of 2 John. If you're not sure where that is, go to the end of your Bible and work backwards. So we have Revelations, the last book of the Bible, then there's Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. But be careful. Jude, 1 John, and 2 John are each only a handful of verses apiece, probably only a page or maybe a page and a half in your Bible. Um, now, if you don't have a printed Bible and you got your phone, just type in 1JN and you're good to go. It'll take you right there. Now, let me clarify. This is not John as in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you turn to John, just John, you're going to be looking at it going, he's not reading what I'm reading, and I know that. So this is 1 John, or 1 John. So now that I've killed a little bit of time and let you find it, uh, let's look at what he has to say. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. In order to be a part of a family, you have to have had an experience. Some experience that makes you a member of the family. That could be an experience of birth. It could be an experience of adoption. It could be an experience of marriage, but you've gone through some experience that has made you a member, a part of that family. And we see that here in the first, four, uh, first three verses. He's going to tell us that in order to be a part of God's family, you have to have had an experience that brings you into the family. Look how he describes it, that which was from the beginning. Now, he doesn't mean the beginning of time or even the beginning before time, but he means the beginning of Christianity, the beginning of Jesus' ministry on the earth and those that followed him, uh, that sort of thing. He says, that from, which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Now, none of us in here have actually physically spent time with Jesus. We've not seen him walk the earth. We've not seen him sleep in the bottom of a boat. We've not seen him take bread and feed the multitudes. We've not physically seen Jesus being present with us. If you think that you've spent three years walking physically with Jesus, let me know, we'll get you help. Okay. None of us have done that. But John did. 
John was one of the 12 apostles. From the day he was called as a fisherman on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, John spent three years with Jesus, physically with him. He touched him. He, he saw everything they did. He witnessed the miracles. He was even there at the crucifixion of Jesus. He says, what he's saying is, when he says, we have seen and we have looked and we have touched, he says, I am a witness. I, I, have, I have seen this. I, I am an eyewitness to all these things. Now, the people to whom he is writing have not had that experience. They are second generation Christians. They are Christians because of what they've heard from the people who actually saw Jesus do all of these things. Meaning that we are, well, not really second generation Christians. You may feel like you've been around that long, but no. We're like maybe, you know, 50th generation or whatever, but it's, but we, but we, or we believe what we believe because it has been passed down through the generations. We have, we have, we haven't, personally witnessed Jesus doing these things, but we have the testimony of them from eyewitnesses like John. He says, we have, we have seen this, touched it, heard it, all those kind of things. Now, who has he seen? The Word. In verse 1, he says, concerning the Word of life. Now, why does he say Word? John likes to describe Jesus as the Word. This is one of his common uh, designations. Word is what describes you. Word is what represents you. You've probably heard this, someone, tell me about yourself. Your word, it represents who you are. Now, if you are a person of your word, then what you say is a correct representation of yourself. I know some people lie about themselves. Yeah. I know some people lie about themselves to themselves. But because this is God, and God does not lie, the Word is an accurate representation of God because Jesus Christ, who is the Word, is God. And so if you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. If you want to know how God behaves, look at Jesus. Because Jesus is the Word, but not just the Word of life. He is the, the, this Word of life that was made manifest. Now, manifest is not a term we use a lot. But the idea behind it is to show forth. Jesus has shown forth what God is like. And, and the idea here primarily is his life. And so notice what he says, that, that we have seen it, heard it, touched it. The life that is made manifest, been demonstrated, declared through Jesus Christ. And he says it again, we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. He said, we, we testify to these things. We testify that we have seen this. And what is the testifies to and proclaims? The eternal life, which with the Father and was made manifest to us. Now, what is eternal life? Eternal life is not living forever. Everybody... Everybody is going to live forever. Everybody is going to live forever. The question is, are you going to live forever in heaven with Jesus Christ, or are you going to live in forever in hell separated from the things of God? But everyone will live forever. So eternal life isn't just living forever. Instead, eternal life is about a relationship. Here's how the Bible describes it. And this is eternal life, that they might know you, the one and only God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life is a relationship with God that we have through Jesus Christ. It's not just living forever, but it is having a life that reflects I am in relationship with God. I, have, through this experience, have become a part of the family of God. And so he proclaims to us eternal life that was made uh, with the Father and was made manifest that we have seen. Now, why is it that John is making this proclamation about the word of life? Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. In other words, he says we are proclaiming this message of life in Jesus so that you will be in fellowship with us. In other words, so that we will act like family toward one another because we realize we are family. Yes. Yes. We have fellowship with one another. On. Family should like each other. To want to fellowship with one another. So we would have fellowship with one another. In other words, I know that we are different. I know we look different, talk different, sound different, and, and live different, different hobbies, and lots and lots of differences. But none of those are what bind us together. What creates fellowship among us is that we are a part of the family of God because we've had an experience with Jesus Christ. Yes. 
We belong to him. And we have this fellowship with each other, with one another, because we are in his family. But not only do we have fellowship with us, And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, here is the idea. We are one family in fellowship with one another because we are in family with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Our fellowship with God creates our fellowship with one another. And so, he says that that we are one family. He wants to declare all that we have seen. In other words... You and I need to be a part of the family of God to experience the family of God, to be a part of the fellowship of God. In higher education, you are allowed at most institutions to attend a class. Check it out. See if it's something that you want to do. See if it's something that you want to experience. So um, on occasion, I'll have People, they'll just attend one of my classes. They just want to check out graduate school and see what it's like. Now, no one ever just comes to check out a Hebrew class. I get that. But they'll come to a Genesis class or something. They'll show up and they'll sit through a class because they're checking it out. Do I want to to be a part of this? They're, they're, They're examining in us. Then after that, sometimes they enroll and become one of us. You're aware that Christianity works exactly like that. People check us out. They examine us. Is the Bible really true and trustworthy? Is Jesus really the way that we get to heaven? Does it really not matter how much I've disobeyed God, that in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I can experience forgiveness? If I belong to Jesus, am I really going to check us out? And our hope and prayer is that after checking out what Christianity is about, checking out what the Bible says, that they become one of us, that they enroll with us. That they have fellowship, that they are a part of our family. And so, in order to be a part of the family of God, you have to have this experience that brings you into the family of God. But not only do we need an experience, but also there is a a truth that we live out. Look what he says in verse 4. And we are writing these things. We are writing these things. I don't want you to miss the word writing. It's very, very important. What the Bible is telling us is that we have a record of what Jesus did. We don't base our faith on hearsay or what somebody heard somebody say as they talked about somebody. You know, I heard it from another who heard it from another who heard it from another. It doesn't work that way. We have the writings of eyewitnesses and not just the, the record from eyewitnesses, but the record of eyewitnesses, the vast majority of whom gave their life for the claim that Jesus died and rose again. One of the reasons why we accept the validity of the biblical record when it speaks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the linchpin of all Christianity, the reason we accept their testimony is because they were willing to die for it. And people don't die for something they know is false. They're not going to give their life what they know to be a lie. I mean, Charles Colson said this is the reason he became a Christian. Three weeks into the Watergate investigation, they started cracking. He said, here we were. He said, we couldn't even make it three weeks. Now, these people died. You don't die for something that you don't really believe and know happened. And so we have the written record of people who were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, well, I'm writing this. And why is he writing it? That our joy may be complete. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because it's a significant statement. So now for the third time, he's going to say, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. Why does he keep repeating this over and over again about this proclamation? Here is the reason, because he wants to make sure we understand that the message is the message and it does not change. The message of how to get to heaven, the message of Jesus Christ It wasn't different last Sunday than it is today. And it will not be different next Sunday than it is today. The message of the Bible, the message of Christianity, the the fundamental facts upon which our faith is built was not different for my grandparents and for me and then it's different for my children and different for my grandchildren and then when I get to be 100 and have even great great grandchildren is going to be different. Yes, I'm an optimist. It is the same message, generation after generation after generation. There's only one message that we proclaim, and that is that in Jesus Christ, you can have complete forgiveness and eternal life. 
And apart from him, there is no forgiveness and there is no eternal life. And so he, for the third time, he said, this message, I want to make sure you grasp what it is that I'm communicating to you and proclaiming to you. And what is this? That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Yeah. Now, why don't you talk about light? Well, light has a divine origin. The Bible says that God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, for those of you who like preacher lists that all start with the same letter, I'm going to give you a list, four Ps. I'm sorry. Sometimes we just get afflicted this way. I'll get over it in the morning. So what about light? It is pure. And God is pure. There is no deception there is no lie ever found in God. God is completely trustworthy because he is completely pure. Not only is light pure, but light brings life. Yes. Light produces life through the photosynthesis process. They, they, so in God who is light, we find life. Light protects us. Listen, you understand this. Oh, you understand this. All of us at some point in our life have gotten up in the middle of the night or late at night or early in the morning and didn't turn on a light and ran into something. Light protects us. I used to think I could navigate any church in the dark because I've been in enough church buildings. I don't think so. One of the worst injuries I ever had was running into a pew that was bolted to the ground. That sucker wasn't moving, and I hit it full speed in the dark. I'm telling you, the light protects us. It shows us the dangers. It shows us the things that will trip us and cause, cause us to fall. So in God is light to preserve and protect us. But most importantly, when the Bible describes light, it is describing a person. We do not worship a thing. We don't worship an it. We worship a person, Jesus Christ. Our faith is in a person, Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, he gives a great description of the person that we worship. We're not going to take time to read all this morning. In the beginning was Word, and Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, and all that. And so he, when he did all that, the person of Jesus Christ. Now I want to go back to what he said in verse 4 to help us grasp how cool it is, this whole idea of being in the light, because it makes our joy complete. What does it mean that our joy is complete? How many of you have a favorite team? I don't, just pick any sport, it doesn't matter. Some of you are so lying. Come on, how many of you have a favorite team? This any sport, it doesn't matter. Does you have a favorite team? Okay, and it doesn't matter what sport it is. Okay, you can be hockey. Oh, come on, we live in the desert. It isn't like you go out in the backyard and play ice hockey. Ah, oh, whatever. Anyway, now you know, one of my kids is a big hockey fan. So let's pick your favorite sport. Okay, now, how many of you, your favorite team, whatever sport you want to think of, have made it to the championship game or the championship series? Man, y'all a bunch of pathetic fans. Like, y'all have nothing in life you ever root for? Okay, y'all need to talk to me after. I'll turn y'all to NASCAR. I'll teach you how to watch them going around in ovals. Now, what wedge is and how cars get tight and loose. And I'll, I'll help you. I'll give you an education. You'll be a NASCAR fan for the rest of your life. You'll be rooting for Fords. First on race day, babe. That's what it stands for. Now, come on. How many of you, your team has made it? Now, I mean, you go, well, my team over here in this sport didn't make it. My team over here in this sport did How many of you ever had a team make a championship game? There you go. Now, how many of you have ever had a team make a championship game and they lost? Okay, so here's the way that it works. The first time your team ever makes a championship game, you're just thrilled they made the game. You're just, it's great. You're excited. Yeah, we lost, but at least we made it. At least we made it. But you know, if your team's made it a few times, they lose every time, it really loses the luster. It's like, man, we need to win one of these. We need to win one of these sometime. We, we, need, we need a championship. You see, it's great when your team makes it, but your joy is not complete until they've won it. How many of your team has won a championship? I can raise both hands. I got lots of teams that have won it. I mean, they've won a championship. Your joy is complete. Those of you who are Cardinals fans, you know what I'm talking about. To be oh so close. It was great to make the Super Bowl, but, but it is tough. It's exciting, but your joy is not complete until the championship. Here's what he's saying when he says that in Christ our joy is complete. Jesus doesn't get us close and then leave us. Nope. 
Our joy is complete. In Christ, we will eventually be champions because we will arrive at the throne room of God to worship him forever. That is what he means. So he says, our joy is going to be complete. He is never going to leave us just a little bit short. Not just a taste of victory, we will have victory. In other words, if you are part of the family of God, you are a part of a championship family. Somebody, I'll say amen right there. We belong to a championship family. And so now in verses six and seven, he says, if we're a part of this family, then we should look like it and live like it. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, let me see if I can summarize that statement. You, claim, you cannot claim Jesus and live like the devil. You cannot claim Jesus and live like the devil. You're going to live like whoever it is that you claim. So if we say we have fellowship with him, but we are walking in the darkness. We are liars and not practicing the truth. However, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we belong to him, we live like we're part of the family. Now, I want to make sure we grasp this. When I say we're a part of the family, and we live like it, I mean we really live like we are one family. We are one body. We have fellowship with one another. I'm saying, help us understand what I mean by we belong. My family, like a lot of families, have people that became Smiths by birth, and we have others who became Smiths by adoption, and we have others who became Smiths by marriage. So a number of years ago, we were having a family reunion. And one of my nephews, who was adopted in the family, he didn't, get in, he didn't go get any food. No, he went straight to the dessert table. And he didn't just go to the dessert table and get a piece of pie or cupcake. I'm telling you, that boy heaped it up. I mean, it was a mountain of desserts. This pot, I was so proud of him. I mean, the, I hadn't even got my food yet. I'm thinking, I might skip and just run right to the dessert line. I mean, he had this plate was mounded, this giant mound of all these desserts piled up on this plate. He's walking through the kitchen and, and I just made the comment, I said, man, he is a smith. One born in it, he's just as smith as anybody. Was, he, he's a part of our family. That's right. And he lives like somebody that's in our family. Because let me tell you, there's one thing I can say about us smiths. Man, we like dessert. <laughs> Some of you like to be part of my family, wouldn't you? And so he said, so he said we, are, we are one family having fellowship with one another. Yeah, we have lots of differences, but we have these, the, the one thing that binds us together. And because we are his family, we live like people that are a part of the family. People see us and go, there's one of those Christians. They see that we are part of the family. Now, notice how he describes it. He uses this word a couple times, walk. We walk. What does it mean to walk in the light or to walk in darkness? The idea is to walk about. Not like walk about, like around something, but it just means like to walk around. You know, my life never stands still. Now, some of this, because I never stand still. But... Uh, some people have been cursed to live with that for a long, long time. But I, you, your life doesn't stand still. You continue to walk through life. Sometimes you, you need to pause for a moment because there's a tragedy that happens and there's something you have to deal with. But, but life continues. And you just continue moving through life. And so as you continue, so he talks about walking about wherever you are in life, you are continuing to walk like a Christian. You're continuing to walk like you're a member of our family. And, and we understand this. We understand that life doesn't stop, that life continues. This is why if you've moved here from somewhere else and you've been away for a while and you go back to your hometown, it didn't stay the same. You know, people don't go, oh, she moved. Everybody stop. And we'll just wait until she comes back home so all's the same. It's not like that. 
Life continues as we walk around through life. And so no matter where you are in life, as you are moving through life, you are always doing it as a member of God's family. But here's the really cool thing. If you are walking around in life in the light, and the rest of us are walking around life in the light, that means we are walking together. And people who are walking together, what do they do? They have a conversation. I didn't know that about you. You know him? I know him too. And then at some point we drop that line. Man, it's a small world. I mean, we we fellowship with one another because we are walking in the light together with one another. So what does it mean then to fellowship? The word fellowship means to share. As a matter of fact, the term was used in a letter, was discovered, written in the fourth century by a doctor to his wife. And this is what he said. With you alone, I have shared my life. And the word shared is the same word for fellowship here. We fellowship with one another when we share our lives with each other. And why wouldn't we want to share our lives? We're a part of the same family walking in the light together. Hello? This is not bad. This is good that we are walking in the light together. Now, the, the, the last phrase in verse 7 is the key phrase, pulls everything together. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It is through the blood of Jesus that we become a member of the family. And it is through the blood of Jesus that we are kept as members of the family. And it is through the blood of Jesus that we are one family. Yes. Now, I know preachers are notorious for telling stories that might not be exactly the way they say it. But what I'm about to tell you is a true story. I used to commute back and forth to school uh, with a couple of guys. A friend of mine, Kevin Hand, pastor a church a few miles from where I was pastoring while we were in school. He got in the van on a Monday morning and said, Man, you're not going to believe what happened to me this weekend because I've never had anything like this. He got word the lady in his church was disgruntled. So he went to see her on Saturday. When he went to see her, he just said, you know, ma'am, I heard that, you know, there's some things you're not happy about. And I would just, you know, wonder, you know, would you like to share them, you know, talk about them. She said, yeah, I'm not happy. You're always trying to get us to talk to each other and everything. I don't go to church to bond with people. <laughs> make this stuff up. I don't go to church to bond with people. Yes, you do. If you're walking in the light, you're supposed to bond with us. We're supposed to be in fellowship with one another, helping to encourage one another. And what is it that bonds us together? It is the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. I know we look different, we talk different, we sound different, we have different hobbies, we live in different places. I realize there are a host of differences, but none of that matters. What matters is we are one family found together in the light because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and because we are a family of the forgiven, we are a family of forgivers. We have been forgiven. And when others stumble because they didn't turn the light on, when others have injured us because they're not walking in the light maybe as well as they should or as well as we should, we forgive. Uh We forgive. See, the way the family keeps fellowshipping is even when we don't get it right, We forgive because we have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. So who all is a part of this family? Everybody who has given their life to Jesus Christ. Everybody who has put their faith in the fact that Jesus died to pay the penalty for our guilt, was buried and rose again the third day, and in him and him alone is everlasting life. All that have put their faith in Jesus Christ are a part of his family. All who have. All those belong to him. And because we belong to him, we fellowship with one another and we walk in the light with one another. Listen, Christianity ought to be on the forefront, the forefront of what it means to love one another. We should be on the forefront of what it means to break down barriers. We should be on the forefront of what it means to forgive one another. We should be on the forefront of what it means to be one family bond and bound together. You know what happens when we do that? We're part of a championship team. 
Our joy is complete when we are bound together in him. I don't want to live forever separated from God. I'm glad I'm a part of the family of God. I hope you're a part of the family of God. And the really cool thing is, it does not matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, what your background is, there's only one thing that matters. Do you belong to Jesus? And if you belong to Jesus Christ, you're a part of my family. We're walking together in the light. And here's the really cool thing. Someday, our family is going to have the most incredible family reunion you could ever possibly imagine. We're going to be gathered together in heaven and forever and ever and ever and ever we are going to be worshiping the king while we're eating barbecue pork ribs and banana pudding. Somebody say amen right here. (laughs) This is what it means to be a part of his family. And we should live like people that are a part of this family. Walking in the light, loving one another, forgiving one another. We are one family through Jesus Christ.